Bruce, why don't you put the... Uh, I think it was. was. It's that time, so I'll open this regular meeting of the Simsbury Zoning Commission. This is the first meeting since the commission membership and officers was reconstituted following the November election. I want to start by introducing the members of the commission. I'm Bruce Elliott, newly elected commission chairman, and having trouble adjusting to the microphone, but uh, the commission is made up of some know this, but the commission's made up of six regular members and two alternates. The regular commissioners include myself, plus our vice chairman, Tony Braz, who's on my left. And then our other colleagues include Diane Madigan, Tucker Sauls, Kate Beal, and Shannon Leary. In addition, we have two alternates, Dave Moore and Josh Michelson. I also want to point out that three commission members are licensed professionals. Those are Kate, who's an architect, along with Tony and Dave Moore, who are attorneys. It will be our goal every time we meet to give fair and courteous consideration to matters that come before us from the residents of Simsbury. Now for the record, we need to formally confirm attendance of our members. I see all six regular members are here, so we won't need to seat an alternate, but for the record, Josh and Dave are both here tonight. The, minute, the, the agenda for the meeting, for those who have seen it, calls for a review of the. It calls for review of the uh, minutes of our meetings, two meetings uh, of uh, hmm. well, two recent meetings. I'm going to defer that to our next meeting, which is January 3rd. So those two minutes are going to be uh, reviewed and acted on. <coughs> Uh, in, on January 3rd. Uh, <clears throat> in that our primary purpose uh, in gathering tonight is to begin the public hearing on application 2338. Submitted. It's really hard to hear. I, I really can't you want to move up to the front row? Okay. Well, then. Yeah. I might try to do it without the microphone. That's not going to work at all. Oh, okay. Here's the same button. Thank you. Yeah, mine is not going to work. Yeah, you just put it Here we go. Better? Does it sound better? I'm not, I haven't spoken. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> in that our, our primary purpose in gathering tonight is to begin the public hearing on application 2338, submitted by the owner of the land at 200 Hop Meadow Street. I want to be sure all in the room are aware of the guidelines we'll be following during the meeting. So I'm going to read a two-minute summary of that framework. Here we go. The public hearing shall be conducted in the following manner. The vice chairman or other assigned individual shall read the legal advertisement for which the application we're hearing was called. Planning department staff will summarize the request. The applicant and its representatives will provide a presentation on their request. The commission may ask questions of the staff or the applicant. The chairman shall next recognize members of the public wishing to provide comments, testimony, or raise questions, all of which must be restricted to the topic of the legal notice announcing the meeting. There is no particular order for comment. Proponents, proponents, opponents, or neutral parties may be intermixed. <laughs> well, let me ask the technician if we can speak yeah, me up. Okay. Want to try what? 
Who would you, Joe, yeah, the lapel mic? You can do it with a wireless mic. Right, the wireless mic won't be picked up by the camera. That's why we have it set up like this. <clears throat> Can, how about, um, can you drag the, the mic from the podium? Yeah. How about we try that, if, if, if it can go far enough? Oh, for that matter, I can go over there. Check one, two. Unfortunately, it's not going the same way. But we can give it a shot. Thank you. OK. This is approximately where I left off. The commission may ask questions of the staff or the applicant. The chairman will next recognize members of the public wishing to provide comments, testimony, or raise questions, all of which must be restricted to the topic of the legal notice announcing the meeting. Can you hear? OK. There is no particular order for comment. Proponents, opponents, or neutral parties may be intermixed. Due to time considerations, the chairman may place a time limitation on public comment. All persons recognized shall approach the podium, right over there, in order to facilitate proper recording of their comments. Before speaking, it is requested that each person give their name and full address before starting to speak. Commissioners may ask questions of those making public comments. The chairman will assure an orderly hearing and shall take steps to re maintain the order and decorum of the hearing at all times. The chairman <laughs> reserves the right to limit debate in the event the discussion becomes unruly, unmanageable, or excessively repetitive. Please refrain from outbursts such as cheering, clapping, or yelling. Please silence all phones and other personal electronics. After public comments are completed for the evening, the applicant shall have the opportunity to address the commission in response to comments received, but not to introduce any new information. At any time during the hearing, the chairman shall allow reports and comments from the planning department and other town staff. Following the conclusion of the applicant's presentation and public comments, the zoning commission will discuss the application and decide on further action. Now, there's just one more housekeeping item before we get going here. Oh with the uh, presentations, but um, in addition to town departments and staff already engaged in evaluating application 2338, I would like to also, I don't, would also like to have the benefit of an assessment by the Planning Commission. So I ask for a motion tonight to authorize staff to refer that application to the Planning Commission. I'll make a motion. Awesome. Um, I move Thank that the you. Zoning Commission refer application 23-38 to the Planning Commission for their assessment. Thank you, Diane. We have a second from Shannon. Um, so that motion passes, and we can move on. Oh, excuse me, I forgot the vote. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. And those opposed say nay. Now the motion carries. Thank you. Um, I think we're ready, quite ready to start the hearing, so I'll ask uh, our Vice Chairman, Tony Braz, to please read the legal notice for this meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Application ZC number 23-38 of SL Simsbury LLC, owner Holden Sabato, applicant, for a type four master site development plan, parent MSDP, close parent, pursuant to section 5.0.B.4 of the Hartford Simsbury form based code, parent HSFBC, close parent, for the construction of a 580 unit residential development at 200 Hop Meadow Street, parent, former Hartford Insurance Property South, close parent, parent assessor's map F17. Block 154, lot 009-2, close paren, Simsbury, Connecticut, 06070, zone HS-FBC. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to have our town planner, George McGregor, come forward and start us off with a summary of the application 23-38. 
Are you going to do that for uh, Dana? Uh, let me try from here. Can you hear me? Better? OK. Uh, so this is ZC 2338. It is a master site plan for 580 unit residential development on 124 acres. The applicant has a full presentation, so I'm not going to um, I'm not going to get into any any of their specifics. Just broadly, the proposal includes 488 multifamily units, 24 duplex units, 68 single family units. It is 100%. Uh, a residential development with no uh, commercial or, or mixed use associated with it. The application includes a community clubhouse and recreation is also on site wetlands, open space, and floodplain. So again, the applicant will walk you through the site plan that they have provided. Just as a reminder, it is, um, it are two pieces of, of the, Hart, the, the original Hartford insurance site, the north site that has been developed to date, and then the south site is what we'll be talking about this evening. I wanted to take one second and talk a little bit about the, the point of uh, the Hartford site and the form base code. So the Hartford site, both north and site, north and south, are governed by its own zoning code, its own form base code. Um, that, that we call it the Hartford Sinsbury form base code. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of initials there. Eight, I don't know if it's easier to say HSFBC or just say it out loud. Um, it was adopted by the Zoning Commission in 2014. Um, this, the application at the time uh, was a partnership between the town as the applicant and the Hartford Insurance Company uh, designed to help market the property and secure future, develop, future development owners and ownership after the closing of the Hartford. So the Silverman Group purchased the site uh, in 2015. Development on the north site began uh, 299 residential units with 120 assisted living and 22,000 square feet of commercial space. That began in 2019. Um, again, the master site development process is really a two-part process. Um, and this form-based code, again, is solely intended for this property. We don't use the Hartford Simsbury form-based code anywhere else in the town of Simsbury. A master plan process, which is what we're undergoing now, and then depending on the outcome of the master plan process, uh, an applicant would follow up with a site plan process. The master site plan is intended to establish the types of development, uh, the degree of development, the scale of development, um, including component zones, which means what kind of uses are intended on the site. It's intended to show building locations and architecture uh, and street locations. Site plan, of course, has more technical information associated with it, uh, stormwater details and those kinds of things. So that comes after this process. It is what we call a type four application and that's important for this process. That's what triggers the, the public hearing. Um, under a type four application, an applicant is permitted under the code to, um, to ask for modifications to the standards that apply in the Hartford form base code. So in this particular case, the applicant is asking uh, to change the, the, the component elements, essentially to allow it to have all residential on one end, uh, as, as well as some specific technical standards. Uh, staff would, would offer for the record the staff report, and then I, I would make note of letters uh, and emails I received over the weekend to make those part of the public record. I've provided those to you. They're in front of you, and those were letters from uh, H. Calabro, Flynn, Jay Calabro, Kim, and Nash. And I've been here since about three o'clock this afternoon. There may be other emails. Um, we'll make those part of, the uh, part of the public record as well. And I would uh, defer my time to the applicant um, or back to the chairman. Thanks, George. I, I would just ask, uh, is there a um, uh, spokesperson for the uh, Silverman Group available. Oh, TJ, I didn't see you back there. So you're going to be the uh, lead spokesman tonight for Silverman? Oh, you want a microphone too? Oh, okay. Yep.
Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I'm T.J. Donahue, firm of Killian and Donahue from Simsbury and Hartford, and I represent uh, S.L. Simsbury, the applicant of this application. I note that uh, I've been before the board many times. I see new members, I see a new chairman, and I'm very pleased to congratulate you all and uh, thank you for your service on this very important commission for Simsbury. Tonight, our presentation is gonna be by Paul Vitaliano of VHB. He's gonna do the site orientation and go through the site details with you. Rod Slowicki will help him, and Laura Krosky of Krosky Architects is here as well. But first, I'd like to start, introduce you to Holden Sabato, a young man who's the director of all development in Simsbury for the SL Simsbury Group, and he'd like to address the board and then introduce Paul. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Holden Sabato. I'm the development director at the Silverman Group. First off, I would like to express our appreciation to town staff and all volunteer commissioners who have participated in our combined success as partners in the adaptive re reuse of the Hartford to this point. We welcome the opportunity to be before the commission with its new leadership and members. We are excited to be here tonight to present the second phase of the Ridge at Talcott Mountain and to answer all questions you have following our presentation. I'd like to provide you a brief, a brief background of who we are at the Silverman Group. We are a family-owned real estate investor and developer headquartered in the suburb of Basking Ridge, New Jersey. We own property all along the East Coast and specialize in residential and industrial development. Our experience in projects such as this one has been time tested and proven and we are confident in what we are presenting to you tonight. Being family owned, every project we undertake is personal and we maintain a small team to handle all matters. In other words, you're not dealing with an institutional giant here, rather a company who takes pride in what we build and pays particular attention to detail. The Silverman business model is to develop, build, own, and manage as long-term investors. As such, we are committed to our developments. In 2015, as George mentioned, we purchased the property from the Hartford Insurance Company after they shut down operations with a roughly 640,000 square foot office facility. The sale included what we now reference as the North Site and the South Site. Through similar fashion to this application, we have built the North Site into a highly successful residential community known as the Ridge at Talcott Mountain consisting of 299 rental units, all of which are occupied. Our goal for the south site is to complete the build out of the Hartford site and transform a vast piece of land that has been sitting vacant and planned for develop development for years now. The Ridge at Talcott Mountain South will complete the Talcott Ridge community. The project will take advantage of the isolated nature of the site through the natural buffers offered by the property, as well as the views of Hubline Tower and the Ridge. As with our completed community adjacent to the north, we are well aware a primary element of our success is powered by the quality of life of Simsbury, and as such, we are pleased to be here. Our professionals have carefully laid out the site in response to extensive internal team dialogue and planning, meetings and input from town staff, as well as informal meetings with the Zoning Commission, the Conservation Commission, and the Design Review Board. We look forward to continuing to work with the town through this application, and we are appreciative of the assistance and cooperation we have received in preparing this application. Thank you, and I'll hand it off to Paul Vitaliano of VHB. Thanks, Holden. Once again, my name is Paul Vitaliano. I'm the Director of Land Development at VHB. We're located in Wethersfield, Connecticut. Um, I'm just gonna quickly orient everyone to the site. I, I know everyone's fully aware of the site, but um, just in case um, when people are looking at the plans, just so they know kind of what they're looking at. Um, and we're gonna start with the, just a couple of existing aerials. So this is an aerial from 2015 when the Hartford building was still um, was still up. So you could, you could see the building there um, and it's kind of uh, radiating rings of parking. Um, this is a more recent image from this year. Um, you can see the building's been, been demolished, which it has been for several years now, and you can see the site's fallen under, um, you know, basically been overgrown a little bit, and with the lack of use, it's starting to deteriorate. 
and, and basically it's going to take a significant amount of, of effort and investment by the Silverman Group to basically make this um, a useful property again. And if you indulge us for a moment, we did do a drone flight of the site um, just a couple days ago or last week. I'd like to just play that for a couple minutes just so you can kind of get a flavor as to how the property looks today. We do encourage the, the commission if they were interested to, to see the site firsthand. Um, once you're there, you really realize the scale of it. And you realize once you're internal to the site that you are kind of isolated, you're secluded. There's areas that, that face um, very beautiful views in the back. Um, you kind of lose sight of Hot Metal Street very quickly when you're in there. Um, so once again, we, we welcome you to, to see that. All right, thank you. So this is um, the master site development plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And once again, just for some orientation, um, you could see here at the far left of the page, this is just the tip of the northern site, um, what we call the north, just for, for reference. Obviously, we're here to talk about the south. Minister Brook bisects the north and south, so it's running through here. Obviously, Hot Metal Street is along our, our western boundary. The Farmington River is off the page. You can see a little portion of it there and and to the south and i'm going to point to this one to the south um there's a, a law office a small law office just off the screen here and then two um, residential buildings uh kings ridge at simsbury and talcott acres um, which is our, our neighbors immediately to the south so the project at talcott mountain the ridge at talcott mountain south is designed as a pedestrian friendly walkable community connecting gathering places passive open spaces and a variety of residential housing through a block style roadway system with integrated sidewalks. The development is designed and organized with the central stacked flat quadrant block. And what I mean by that is these darker red buildings here, or light brown, however you wanna see it, is um, those are the, the apartment buildings. So these are like the, the blocks that we're saying is, is basically quadrating off this. And there's two more buildings here and two buildings along the front here. You may, may remember when we came to you informally, there were two other buildings here, we, we removed those. And then as you move over to the, to the south, these buildings are duplexes. So we have 12 duplexes, totaling 24 units. That's this, this lighter brown color. Um, the darker brown are the detached garages for the duplexes. And as you continue south, these lighter, 10 are the single family residential buildings. Um, so we have it to the south, and then also we have it to our far east. So once you get beyond the apartment buildings and you get through this buffer zone, which is our clubhouse, our amenity space, you can see some pool and um, recreational activities, and there'll be a landscape buffer here. Once you get beyond that, you'll have this road system for those single family homes. Uh, the buildings will be along a continuous streetscape and the building mass, as I mentioned, reduces um, as you proceed south and east and that's to enhance the neighborhood feel and minimize impacts of the view shed. Additionally, there'll be a multi-use trail system along the site frontage, which will link to the Farmington River Trail and also to the Farmington Canal Heritage Trail. That, that trail is shown here um, and also would extend extend to the north and connect to the trail that was terminated when the north property was built. Um, we did receive some staff comment to extend that trail along our entire site frontage to our southern property line, and we are going to do that. So that would basically, basically be extending it, extend it this way to the southern property line. Um, sidewalks and um, walkability is very important to us. It's what helps build a sense of community, um, and they contribute to that walkability, it um, promotes it, as I said, promotes that sense of, of place and sense of home. Um, the sidewalks are provided along the roadway blocks throughout the development and they connect all the different uses, whether it's from apartment to townhouse to, to single family home 
to, um, to the clubhouse or also to the site frontage. The sidewalks are connected throughout and you can kind of see that with the lighter tan, basically that's in, in, front, in front of all the buildings in, in every direction and in most cases on both sides of the road. And those sidewalks obviously connect to the trails I mentioned. Um, there's our, our primary access points, our only access points to the site from a vehicle standpoint are the same two existing connections that exist today. So you have what's the signalized intersection here and um, the secondary entrance to the north here. So they're the same locations that you see out there today. Sorry, this way. So the gateway entrance to the community features a central roundabout and that leads your, your view as you enter the site towards the common green area and then further east to the clubhouse. So the, um, the sections or the perspectives that you have here in front of you that are all just taken from the master plan that you have. Uh, this one on the left is, is the roundabout itself. So we just wanted to feature that to show that on the roundabout would be a nice uh, planted entrance uh, gateway to the site with the planted roundabout in the middle. And like I said, your view continues this way um, through the, the green space and onto the clubhouse. The view to the right of that is, there's typical sections with, within the master plan just showing the different types of interfaces you would have between roads. This happens to be one with single family homes, which are the light tan at the top of the page and um, duplexes at the bottom. And just to put in perspective the, I'll go to the next slide, but so once again, this is, this is another typical type of interface where you would have apartment buildings coming together um, with, with crosswalks and sidewalks. And if you've been to the north site, um, when you look at a cross section of, of really um, the, apartment, the apartment side, since that's what you would see at the north, the relationship between the building, the landscape in front of the building, then the sidewalk and the road, then the on-street parking, we've carried that over to this site as well. We feel it works well in the north. We want it to be consistent. So we're, we're having that same basically cross section here. So if you see in the packet, you'll see some of that cross section, but also in these, in these visuals. And obviously if you're out there and you see the north and you're standing at in front of an apartment building and you kind of look at how that cross section of the road is and the, the relationship between the road, the parking and the buildings, we intend to, to duplicate that here in the south. This next slide is intended to basically, it overlays our proposal our proposed um, development with the underlay of the, the Hartford when the building was there. You can see the building still on this image here to the top. And this is important for, for several reasons. And one of them is to really demonstrate that we're staying within the limits of development. So when you look at these, I know it's, it's, a, little, it's a little tricky, but you can see the, the underlying edge of pavement here and also the, obviously the building and the ring road behind the Hartford building and this parking lot here and the parking lot all the way around here. So you can see that except for really at the south where we're pushing a little, a little further um, south, um, that we are, we are staying within the developed footprint. In fact, we're actually um, reducing impervious by seven acres, which is not something you, you have a lot of opportunities to say. And what we're doing with, with this also, we're gonna maintain as much of the vegetation along the frontage as possible. Um, I'm not gonna point to that one because I'd be zooming right at you. But there's a large berm and um, vegetated buffer here that we're gonna maintain. And we're gonna try to maintain as much of this as possible and some down here as well. Whatever we can't maintain, we're, we're gonna re reconstruct. Um, so you will have kind of that, um, that buffer from Hot Meadow Street. So another difference between this and the north that we wanna point out since I'm talking about buffers is that um, this is set back a little further than the north is, um, really by more than 100 feet. What I mean by that is that the closest building at the north is around really 140 feet to the street. And the assisted living um, is around 280. And, and these for the most part are 300 to 340 feet back. And another important difference is that in the north, the buildings are parallel to Hot Metal Street. So they actually do create uh, a more uh, forward facing frontage. Whereas these, you can see these buildings are, are perpendicular to it. So even, even when I say that we're 340 feet away, we're really 340 feet away to like a short, what we call the short side in the front corner, as opposed to a front massive building. Um, a parking is something that um, we paid attention to. The, the town code is two spaces per unit. We're just shy of that. So our, 
our master plan says we're 1.99, we're four spaces short of that. But for the most part, um, so we, we meet that town requirement. That's for the apartment area, the, t uh, the duplexes and the single family homes. We didn't count those because they have garages and they have parking in their, in their um, driveways, which uh, Laura from Krosky Architects will um, explain a little more. So I just wanna go through a couple of other items and then um, before we hand it over to Laura to talk about architecture. So very quickly, the um, staff provided a very thorough report, which you all saw. Um, I just wanna comment on a couple of the items that um, were alluded to in there. And the first one was traffic. So from a traffic standpoint, the infrastructure at this site and what the DOT basically has approved is that the infrastructure could handle what the Hartford had, right? As far as their peak, their peak um, vehicle traffic, and what we have here is far less than that. It's not even close. So um, basically, we are not expecting any improvements. Um, the DOT has already approved. Um, when we did the north, they basically approved that the south, if this was built out much more denser than this, would basically the infrastructure on Hot Meadow could could handle that volume of traffic. And once again, this volume of traffic is going to be significantly less than what the road can handle. Also, we're completing um, economic impact report. Um, we don't have that fully completed yet, but we did finish a school impact report, um, which I believe was included in your, in, your, in your packet, but I just wanna go over a couple very quick points of that just so we don't get caught up in some numbers. But basically, our report indicates that the increase would be between 96 and 115 students to the school system. And basically, our analysis shows that the project would have a net fiscal benefit to the school system of between one to $1.5 million. And we also know that the projected increases in enrollment by grade level would not result in increases above the recommended class size. So that is something that our our experts worked and they worked with the school board and the school officials to get that data and process that data. And that's in one of the reports that, um, that you have with you. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, a project manager at VHB. He's gonna talk about the, um, the, the views to the ridge line and the tower. That's something that obviously we know is important to everyone. So I want Ross Wolicki from VHB to explain how we came up with um, the views that we're about to show you. Thanks, Paul. My name is Rod Svalicki. I'm a project manager at VHB. Uh, I've been working on this project since the inception of the North Site, so I've worked closely with the, uh, the town here, and I know how uh, crucial this viewshed is for the community and for members of this commission. So when we, we took a, a very uh, analytical look at the views for the South Site, and it, it is much different than the North Site, right? It's, the differences are there's there's mature vegetation today, the curvature of the road and the topography versus the north site where you have a straightaway of Route 10. It was a very flat farm field. There's nothing in the way. So when we analyzed this, uh, this this section of road for the view of the ridge and the tower itself, when you're heading northbound, when you're heading northbound on Route 10, as you as you get to the property frontage, you see here, these are all mature trees, maybe 100 feet tall with berms. There's, there's really no view of that tower or ridgeline as you're approaching to the north. You get to the inter, uh, signalized intersection here and you really have to turn your head to see that, but you do get a glimpse of it in this opening that the Hartford has today of, of the tower and the ridge itself. But by the time you're past the signalized intersection, you'd have to turn your head about 180 degrees to really see, see the ridge at all or, or you know it'd be a difficult look. So heading southbound in this direction is where we thought that, that view of the ridge and the tower was really captured on this site frontage. About 400 to 500 feet along here, you, you get intermittent breaks from some of this existing tree vegetation. Um, but I wanted to explain to the commission and the public why we chose these two spots because we thought this was really, this was really the area where you do see the ridge and, and the mountain and the uh, cube line tower there. So specifically on our site, like Paul mentioned, we came back and we eliminated buildings through this section because of that, because we heard the comments of the view and how important that was. So we got rid of the buildings, opened that up a little to maintain that, and I, I, would, I would argue it's probably a little better than it is today because we're gonna get rid of some of that 
taller vegetation, plant it a little lower, and set the buildings back. So here are two renderings. This is the southern entrance as you're looking at the ridge. So you can see the tall, tall trees in the way block it, um, but you still do get a defined view of that ridge and the tower. To the right is a simulation of the buildings on the site plan that you see. It's, it opens that view up a little bit, maintains it. You can still see the ridge line, the tower. And then as you head, as you head south, so excuse me, the last one was the north entrance. Now this is the south entrance, heading towards a signalized intersection. This is where you stop at the street light and you get to look over your left shoulder and see the ridge line, as you can see on the existing condition on the left. That, that's what it looks like today. That photo is taken this year. And this is, to the right, is a simulation of what this is going to look like. So the sim is based on the grades proposed on site, the actual building heights, the actual placement. It's all uh, scalable and graphically correct. So what we're doing at, at the entrance is opening it up with the roundabout feature to give that nice entry look, frame the view of the tower, and uh, keep, keep that view shed, that, that real pristine four or 500 feet heading south open for, for the public to still enjoy as they drive by. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Laura Krosky, our architect for this project, so she could explain some of the building materials, the unit choices for the commission. Good evening, I'm Laura Krosky with Krosky Architects uh, out of Hartford, Connecticut. I'm the uh, design architect and architect of record for the project. Uh, here we're looking at an aerial view of the master plan and similar to uh, what Paul described, we are transitioning from the apartment buildings in the center boulevard down to duplexes and single families. So we'll look at the architecture similarly starting off with the clubhouse building. Now, the clubhouse is at the end of the boulevard. This is a one-story structure with a pergola off to the south. This will have a prefabricated cupola, asphalt shingles, uh, roof shingles, excuse me, vinyl siding, trim boards, double-hung windows with transoms, and divided light entry doors with side lights, side lights for a grand entrance. The pergola on the south uh, leads out to the pool area and creates a nice seating area for residents. And the clubhouse provides approximately 7,000 square feet of amenity space, which include fitness room, co-working space, pet washing station, gaming rooms, a main hall with a kitchenette, and a bar space that leads out to the pool area, as well as men's and women's locker rooms. This is a view uh, from the boulevard looking across from one side to the other at the four-story apartment buildings. Oh, sorry. And looking at the four-story apartment buildings, these will have similar materials, uh, asphalt shingle roofs. Um, we have stone veneer chimneys, which will help to disguise some of the venting and penetrations through the roof. This will also have vinyl siding, panels and trim boards, a standing seam metal roof at the balconies and bump outs for some decorative flair. This is also very similar to the apartment buildings at the north site, so creating some continuity between those two. And these balconies have slider doors, and then on the first floor, patio swing doors to provide handicap accessible access. The first floor also has nice stone veneer to give it a little bit more of an elegant look. At the rear, we also have um, first floor garage entry doors, and we've mixed these up a little bit to provide some variation on the first floor rear facade. The four-story buildings provide uh, about 45 units, and there's a nice large lobby uh, at the entryway, package room, and rentable storage on the first floor. And as you can see in the image at the bottom, these have uh, private garages, which would be assigned to a unit, as well as tandem spaces behind those. And the two garage spaces on either end would be handicap accessible. 
looking at the three-story building. This is very similar to the four-story apartment building, very similar materials, um, with a little bit more of the stone, um, stone veneer at the front, and similar, the parking at the rear and first floor. These apartment buildings provide 32 units, a mix of one and two bedrooms, and have the similar package room and storage, as well as uh, private parking garages. Then we look at the duplex, duplex areas. So this is a street perspective. There are two types of duplexes. Um, these, all, again, have similar materials as the apartment buildings. And these, have a, a, these are two bedrooms, um, two bedroom units, and buildings are approximately uh, 2,900 square feet. Apartments at approximately 1,450. And then the second duplex unit type is more of a corner building. It has a front entry on the main street, and then it also has a side entry to speak to the, the side street as well. Similarly, these are two-bedroom apartments, and they provide approximately 1,450 square feet. The, all of the duplexes have a detached garage, which is a shared two-car garage between the two duplexes. Each apartment would have one space in the garage and then one tandem space behind, and these would be separated so they would be private garages. Then we get into the single family area. This is a street perspective, and we have quite a variety of single families to avoid a cookie cutter look. These, I'll just run through these fairly quickly. Um, these are all similar materials as we previously discussed, asphalt shingle roofing, vinyl siding and trim, uh, double hung windows, French patio doors out to a rear patio, uh, half-light entry doors, and a variety of decorative elements such as gables, shutters, bay windows. And each of these has an attached garage. These single families are either a three-bedroom unit with a one-car garage, like shown here, or they are a four-bedroom with a two-car garage, as shown here. And there are a variety of layouts, um, and again, using a variety of different architectural elements to start to distinguish the houses and create more of a uh, traditional streetscape. We also have two units that are handicap accessible. So this one shown here has a full master bedroom suite on the first floor and also provides an accessible garage. And similarly, we have a four-bedroom, two-car garage, which is also handicap accessible with a full master bedroom suite on the first floor and a double-car garage that is also accessible. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that completes our presentation. We're here to participate and, and respond to anything anybody has. Well, uh, and that I don't have another mic, um, let me just say this. What, what I'm mostly interested in hearing from the public. Um, if you've had enough time to present, we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, I know commissioners might have questions. If you'd like to, we could take a few minutes now and ask questions. Otherwise, I'd rather do that after the public has an opportunity and we can consider what they have to say in addition to what the, uh, the ownership has to say and then ask fuller, more probing questions potentially. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Any preference? No, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. So we'll just move ahead with the public comments. A quick clarification. Okay. One quick, yeah. So, uh, I saw a three bedroom or a three story and four story. Which ones are three story and which ones are four story? Just a quick clarification. Of that. I'm, I'm sorry, you mean on the site plan, which ones are? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So All I right, I'm trying. So, 
So the four stories are these these eight here, okay. or the four, and the other four are three. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to start uh, the opportunity for the public to offer yeah, comments great. and suggestions and whatever. I want to remind everyone though that the comments need to be related to the announcement of this meeting, the legal uh, advertisement. Uh, so that's important. Uh, in addition, um, we're not going to limit the time right away, but if you could keep comments to four or five minutes, uh, we'd like to hear from everyone if possible tonight. So uh, informally, if people would like to gather maybe three or four or five at a time right down here, and just as people finish speaking, others can fill in behind them in that space right over there, and we'll see how that goes. Is there a, a working microphone there? Okay, I guess there's some. Who'd like to be first? John, somebody beat you. Oh, no. There you go. Oh, I also need each person, when you come forward, to give your name and your address, and then you're free to go. Joan Coe, 26 Whitcomb Drive. This application should be rejected as presented. The Silverman Group has been given special treatment by the Zoning Commission by allowing the continuance of additional units without fulfilling its obligation to build the commercial building as shown in the site plan on phase one. There was a negotiated settlement with promises that have not been fulfilled to post the bond in good faith obligation to complete the commercial building by December 2022. The commercial building has not been completed. This is a picture that I took recently of the commercial building that is basically a shell, totally incomplete. So these are the promises that you're getting from this Silverman group that is totally inappropriate. They are not fulfilling their obligations at all. What appeared to be another avenue to game the system was hiring town attorney De Crescenzo to present the development before the East Granby Land Use Commission. This was done without knowledge of the town since town attorney did not file a conflict of interest on his conflict of interest form. Town attorney De Crescenzo was giving advice to the town of Simsbury on the Silverman Group application to protect the town while working for the Silverman Group in East Granby. This conflict now requires the town to hire a private attorney to represent the town's interests as the Silverman Group moves forward. The Silverman Group has not fulfilled its proposed site plan on phase one by trying to gain the system through special treatment and should not be allowed to continue with another project before fulfilling the first contract with the town. Promises made, promises not kept. The Zoning Commission should reject this application until the commercial building is complete with a certificate of occupancy. The Zoning Commission should reject this proposal to develop the 580 unit development. All of my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch and Twitter at Joan Cove for you to review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Tom Turner, 11 Barner Drive, Simsbury. 49 years as a observer in Simsbury. Route 10 traffic, now highly congested for a two-lane highway, not just on Saturday mornings, but all week, week long. Entering Route 10 without a traffic light has become an unsafe, time-consuming effort. Turning on or off Route 10 from my neighborhood south of Antonio's involves a zero to 60 
and crossing your fingers to make it safely. But there are now so many traffic lights dealing with all this that smooth flow has been fully defeated in Simsbury. Taxes for schools, police, ambulance services, roads and walks will all be impacted. I met thousands of residents last year while collecting signatures for our November referendum. The second most common bone to pick with town leaders was how could permissions have been granted to build wall-to-wall -wall apartment and condo buildings up and down Hot Meadow Street from Avon to Granby. But it's water over the dam and the only recourse now is to stop further disgracing of the town character. Thank you very much. I guess it's my turn. Hi, I'm Tim Payne. Um, I live at 35 Cooper Avenue, number 26, which is in the, uh, the North development. I've been there for two years, and I have real concerns about this development, and I've been thinking a long time about how to present this. And I'm gonna break it down into a couple of areas. Number one is, I think the quality of the construction is not, I would call it fair. And I say that because uh, we were moved into our apartment with a broken window, a hole in a window that took seven months to repair. Uh, we, in our apartment, in a corner, we can't open drawers because they hit appliances. Um, in our apartment, there was no grout in the shower at the floor, a pretty important place to prevent water damage. Um, I've talked to neighbors where uh, plumbing was hooked up incorrectly. Um, and I suspect part of this is because with a development this size, perhaps the town inspectors didn't have enough time to thoroughly check things. I do know that when they were building the townhomes, they went up very fast. Those guys worked really, really hard. Unfortunately, uh, their work was not really quality. On, on our, uh, we have a little, I call it a balconette because it's not big enough for a balcony. Um, there's a header that's bare wood. It's just a stud. Uh, it wasn't covered, it's not protected from the weather. Um, I, I echo um, our neighbor there that the, uh, the retail construction in the front, I've been there two years, there's been nothing on the one building on the south side of the, uh, of the entrance. The north side, they just started to build it, but the builders are there, you know, every so often. Um, it looks pretty ragged, and actually the buildings are not aging well. Um, if you drive around and look and see, you'll see things like they haven't finished paving. Um, there's bases for what I suspect are lights. I'm not certain, but there, there's nothing there. There's pipes sticking up out of the ground where uh, irrigation has, has started a about, let's see, two years ago we were there, about a year and three quarters. They haven't quite finished that part yet. Um, what else is there? There's, there's quite a few things. So I'm, I'm concerned about uh, the quality of the construction. I'm concerned about following through on the agreement, as I understood it, that the, south would, uh, the north would be finished before the south could be developed. So I'm concerned about that. The second area that I want to briefly touch on is I was in a town meeting um, a long time ago when the Hartford was being proposed. And I think the same issues that were brought up there are absolutely uh, relevant here. And I think they're all part of the, the thing that you mentioned, the HBFCMR, the, 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 the proposal that you guys uh, put together in 2014 or 15. And that is responsible development of, of the property. Um, as I was thinking about this development, I thought whatever decision is made is permanent. It's not gonna change. So whatever decision is made for development, whether it be recreation, housing, whatever, it's a permanent change and it's gonna change the, uh, the condition of the town. It's gonna affect, as other people will talk about, the schools, the police, the fire department, um, you know, the ability of the town to manage all the services. Um, but I, I encourage you to think really thoroughly about how you want, if your grandchildren were going to be here, what would you want? And then I encourage you to drive through the, the North Development. Um, feel free to give me a call. I'm happy to walk you around and point you out what I see. 
um, and, um, and make up your own mind. But I, I would think very strongly about uh, reconsidering that plan as developed. It was a great presentation, um, but I, I have real concerns. And I think there are some things that are not, not very good for the town in the long run. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ellen Gilbert. I live at Talcott Acres, which is 126 Hot Meadow Street. If you look at the, the um, drawing there or over here, um, there are letters written over the building that I live in. So it's, it, if you draw a line down from where, yes, that's where I live. And um, number one, I want to say that I really support what Joan said and what the resident of um, the North complex says. You know, these are things I didn't know about, but those things are super important in looking at what should have been done and what's coming here on this proposal, which is huge, 580. And um, I want to say number. Uh, I want to say number one, the school impact. I'm. I kind of doubt, doubt those numbers when you're looking at that many homes that we're bringing into a very small area. And right now, Latimer Lane is under reconstruction. And what are we going to do? We're going to build another school. I mean, or or do something with that school. There isn't very much land there for the kids to play outside and go to school. Um, is there a chance that you can go to the superimposed picture? Yes. Thank you. OK. Now, the picture that you saw where I told you where my building is made those houses look like there was a lot of property between those houses and Talcott Acres. But if you look at it now, you can see that there are trees, there is woods where those single family homes are going to be closest to the Talcott Acres property. There isn't very much there. There's very th there's thin woods, and so right now we can't see through. We can't see through only because it's a parking lot. But we're looking at putting some single-family homes so close to where we live, and we deserve to maintain the privacy that we have. We had to give up privacy when that tall apartment building went in next door. I'm not, I am not willing to lose that privacy for building one, which is this way, two, or three, or for my community. So that's, that's my, my most important concern, and it's been a concern for a long time. Um, I would like to maintain as much of the vegetation along Hot Meadow Street because that's part of the Simsbury character. Um, and so as much of the, the old trees that can be saved, I would appreciate. But I really want to maintain the privacy between Talcott Acres and the ridge uh, at South. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharon Thomas, and I live at 42 Brentonwood Drive in Simsbury, Connecticut. So first, I'd like to say um, I've been to a number of these meetings, and I'd like to commend them on the plan, because one of my biggest complaints has been, or suggestions of, uh, have been about multi-level. So the fact that it's not all apartments, 
I'm really happy to see. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see that there was some thought at least put in for single families, um, townhomes, duplexes, and there was mention of a community center because these are all things that I was going to bring up, but there wasn't any discussion, I don't think, about the community center. So if somebody could just speak to that and what's gonna be there, what's gonna be involved, what's the expectation of the use and all of that. Is it you know fee-based or whatever? Um, because to me, this is almost getting closer to not a planned community, but something similar. Um, so that, but then secondly, I'd like to focus on the things that are being shared by other folks that live in nearby. Um, I think it's really important that we see the completion of what's been started before we allow something else to begin. Um, I am, um, I've been impacted by something that was built in town, promises were made to us as residents, and the, you know, people got the, um, what do you call it, the CO, somebody said it, of occupancy, the business did, and we were left as residents trying to fight with the business to get things done. And I'm sure that's what these folks are experiencing right now. It's who's speaking up for them. So it would behoove us to let that get finished um, before we start something new. And then the third thing I'd like to speak to as a member of the Board of Education, not central office, not the administration, as an elected official of the Board of Education, we consistently hear in these meetings that people have spoken to the Board of Ed. I am at every meeting, and no one has come to a meeting and spoken to us. So I would suggest that if you're going to say you're speaking to the Board of Ed, you speak to the Board of Ed. You're welcome to come to our meetings, and you can present this, but this quote that you're making around 96 to 100, I said to someone under 200, I'm, where are you getting them from, you know? Um, and as has already been said, we have, are expending money right now in the build out of um, one of our schools. And this hasn't even been considered. And so this would be a large impact to Tooton Hill, and to Latimer Lane. And so I would just suggest that we get some hard numbers on where you're getting that student increase from, and then some open conversations with the Board of Ed around the timing of all of this. Um, I think that's it for my comment, but I would like to have somebody speak to the community. Um, Hi, my name is Ray Lagan from 27 Saddle Ridge Drive, but I'm speaking as the executive director for the Granby Simsbury Chamber of Commerce. And my only question is, I know the commission report outlined questions regarding commercial and retail development within the new development. And I'm not sure if it was addressed here in full or not. I would be curious if the new development plan has an approach towards that and what it might look like. Thank you. Uh, good evening and congratulations to all the new members of the commission. My name is Pete Harrison and I am a resident of, I guess, the North site at 3 Cooper. I'm also the director of Desegregate Connecticut, which is a pro-homes coalition of community groups that are advocating for land use reform to advocate for more homes, uh, more sustainability, more affordable equity and sustainability. So there, I, I support this project with some, some certain caveats. Um, one is I haven't heard anything mentioned, and I've seen some of the projects before. I believe this is all 100% rental. I would strongly recommend this commission push for some home ownership options. There are uh, programs that the Department of Housing and the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority have created, I know because I've helped advocate for them and get them funded, uh, that creates the opportunity for purchasing, particularly for workforce and affordable housing. So I would hold the developers to uh, pushing for some home ownership, particularly the duplexes and the single family. Uh, two, there's just way too much parking. Uh, that's a pet peeve for any of these large projects. 
Uh, I know that's they're taking away, I think, seven acres of parking for uh, making it more impermeable. That's that's a really great step given the site. Uh, but I would push back, I think, some of the assumptions about parking, having living up north, uh, there's there's too much parking. Um, and then the other thing, and I appreciate that they're going to expand that uh, trail. The trail terminates right now at the edge of the north property. It's going to be great connecting that to the uh, canal uh, road there to get to the, the, the trail. Uh, I wanted to address, there have been a couple of math problems brought up that I think are, are good faith, uh, and also I think some, some math problems that haven't been brought up. Uh, I do this work every day. I have a master's in urban planning from Columbia University. I've been studying this work for 16 years. Um, the traffic issues about Route 10 are legitimate. Uh, I don't think they're related necessarily to this project. As one of the presenters mentioned, it's actually going to be less traffic than during when the Hartford was there. I know my sister worked at the Hartford and was on that campus. Um, but some of the traffic is an issue, but we shouldn't be making the flow of traffic uh, smoother. We should be making it slower so it's safer for everybody. Um, the second is the schools, and I also know um, that that's a good faith concern about that. And I, and I don't know the, the numbers that the developers have brought up. Certainly hold them to account. I know they've been working with the Board of Education or somebody in the administration at least, I think. Um, but there are some demographic math issues here. Uh, communities like West Hartford and Milford that have been building a significant amount of more homes than Simsbury has, has done these types of projections and school enrollment is going to decline, which I'm sure it will do in Simsbury. Demographically, folks are having small families, people are not having as much children. So although I think those are good faith concerns, I would trust that we are in good shape in Simsbury on both of those accounts. Two math problems that I have not heard addressed. One is we are in an affordable housing crisis. And I know that as a home renter in Simsbury who would love to be a homeowner in Simsbury, uh, there aren't a lot of homes available. Some of it's the rates, all of that ex exactly, but we have not been building enough homes. And that means that there are seniors and trapped in homes that are too big for them that would love to downsize and move to a community like the Ridge South. I know that's true for my parents. And there are people that want to start their careers, start their families that don't have those opportunities to do so in Simsbury. I, for one, it's nice to be in this situation, uh, speaking at this meeting as someone who's benefited from a development that, I, that I'm sure, again, in good faith, many people here probably protested against. And I'm the, Chris, the you know, ghost of Christmas present here uh, that I'm here to say, thank God that was built. And you know, I, I understand there's some problems with it. Developers are developers. We have a lovely apartment. Uh, I've lived in places in New York City that are much worse. Uh, this is fine. The maintenance is fine. It's not perfect. I'm sure any problems that exist, exist in any homeowners behind me. Uh, but the point of it is we do not have enough homes in Simsbury. That's why I would love to push this commission to require more affordable home ownership, which is absolutely something a scale at this can, can do. But just in general, very much for the commission, very much for folks in this meeting. Uh, there are lots of voices that are not here, voices like mine, that want to live in Simsbury, that maybe already work in Simsbury, went to schools in Simsbury that can't afford to come back here. I'm not pretending that all these homes, as they're going to be market rate homes for the most part unless we get some concessions, but they're going to be homes that are going to lower the price of living in Simsbury, and that's a good thing. So that's a math problem that you are all tasked with addressing. And I also hold you to the account for the affordable housing plan that was passed in town to make these kinds of changes and encourage this kind of home ownership or, and, and rentership. The second math problem is today, I don't know how many of you had internet or power in Simsbury, uh, but we were facing a climate crisis. And whether your basement is flooding, whether... You're way over five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Just to say it's gonna be very expensive to build the resiliency that we need in town. And this kind of property that's sitting vacant right now being developed into multifamily is going to be a net benefit for finances in Simsbury to address this very major concern. Thank you. Sorry for running long. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Deborah Bishop, but I live at Talcott Acres, and I want to speak in support of all the wonderful comments that Ellen had presented already, and also expand on those a little bit. Um, if you notice those, those homes that are adjacent to Talcott Acres, those are the three and four bedroom single family homes. So, and they're gonna have backyards, not just the buildings, but they'll also be 
There's also backyards that are going to take away more of the, the buffering of the trees that are already there. And I'm c concerned about the high density of those three and four bedroom homes, because that's going to be the areas where there's going to be families with children and uh, just more activity in that corner, right, up, right where we're so used to having nothing. <laughs> um, so, and concern about the three and four bedroom, four, four bedroom homes for, you know, the number of school age children that will be um, coming into the community. And, you know, what Ellen had said about Latimer Lane and, and the size of the classes in the school. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say, just please, Please uh, consider Talcott Acres and, and what, what this means to us to have these buildings so close to us. Which building Thank do you, you live in? Did you say which building you live in? I'm in, um, I'm in building six, so I'm You're there. I'm there. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I am. Yeah. Thank you. But she's president of our board. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Riccadelli. I reside at 32 Northgate. I've been a Simsbury resident for almost seven years now. Initially, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, I've heard some comments over here. Um, I believe the comment was uh, the character of Simsbury. I heard from this gentleman over here about the housing crisis and the affordable housing. Both of them are right. We live here be, and purchased our homes here because of the character of Simsbury. I grew up in Southington, I have lived in Bristol, I have lived in Plainville, and I have lived in New Britain. I have seen the proliferation of Route 10 in Southington from having an Edwards Superfood store, a couple of small businesses, to 35 years later, you cannot move up and down Queen Street, Route 10 in Southington. It could take you an hour to get to one and from the other on a heavy weekend. I used to date someone who worked on Hot Meadow when the Hartford was open. I remember the traffic nightmares. And not just at 9 a.m., not just at 5 p.m., at lunchtime. And speaking to the character of Simsbury, we bought here because we wanted to be here because of the space. Live small, buy small. That, that's what it is. When I need something, I go to Weldon Hardware. I don't go to... Uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. On the occasion that they can't get me what I need, yeah, I will travel out. But I shop local. I live local. Okay, I saved 10 years to be able to afford to move here. So while I understand the housing crisis and the affordability of living here, I also aspired to live here because of that. Because of the quality of life for my family, for the quality of life for my children and to have the proliferation of another 500 homes, and I think that 100 and something students is an extraordinarily conservative estimate as far as what would infiltrate our school systems, as far as the number of students. Outside of the classroom sizes, we have to think about kids with special needs, who's gonna need an extra para, who's gonna need special transportation. The 1.5 million in tax benefit that I think was mentioned will be eaten up in infrastructure costs in the blink of an eye. I pay the same amount of taxes on my property here that I did in New Britain. My New Britain property was worth almost a third of what my property is here. The difference is I see here where my tax dollars go. I see my roads cleaned. I see the town maintained. I see a nice area on Route 10. My fear with a building like this and continued structures like this 
is you will see this town denigrate itself into a Southington, as it is now, or a Plainville, or a New Britain. These are the first steps in a process to take what we have to go to that point. Now, it's extreme, but it is a simple logistical reality. When you look at how Southington started, it is now on par with Plainville. When you look at Plainville 30 years ago, it's coming on par with New Britain. In New Britain, I moved here from New Britain because I couldn't put my kids in that school system. I was outsourcing them to a correct school because it wasn't safe, because the quality of the teachers weren't there, because the class sizes were too large, because the kids weren't learning. We moved here because of the quality of life. And much to what he's saying is, this is wrong. We should be building housing in some areas, but we should be building housing for people to buy, not to rent. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, I'm Lori Boyko from 15 Oakhurst Road. Um, I don't want to do fuzzy subjective math, but if just over two residents average occupy each one of those 580 properties, and I suspect some of those properties will have substantially more than two residents, that will represent a 5% increase in our town population. That's a relatively huge increase all at once, and we've already experienced tremendous growth from other rental development. I'd like to quickly point out that we operate with a representative government. At the risk of stating what should be common knowledge, we elect you to represent us, us being the electors of the town of Simsbury. Our governing bodies don't represent developers or even large taxpayers. On this and all matters before you, it is those who are qualified electors you represent. Not people who want to live here, people who do already live here. As representative of the electors, you should not approve this development as proposed. We don't need 300 people in this room here tonight for you to know what the electors of this town want. Past backlash from previously built apartments on Hot Meadow Street should be enough of a clue. By speaking to literally anyone in this town, you know that this is unequivocally not what any of us want. I have daily conversations with people in this town of all walks of life and all political viewpoints. While there may be issues on which we disagree, I submit to you that the vast majority of us are all on the same page about not wanting to turn Simsbury into an apartment community. There is no scenario in which this is in the best interest of the town. Our town cannot absorb the sheer influx of new residents this will bring. The increase in school population alone, as you've heard, will have a dramatic increase in our town expenses. I do go to the Board of Ed meetings, almost all of them, and I listen to the population increase and student increase reports, and that is a concern. We just added a second ambulance so that it's available if someone needs it in an emergency and will need far more. Our police and fire departments will need vast expansion, more than we're already discussing that they need. Our traffic flow can't handle the increase in traffic. What are we doing? Are we giving any thought to the quality of life in the town we all chose to call home and love? We talk about affordable housing for new residents, but there must be consideration given to the affordability for current residents to continue to live here in our existing homes. We talk about concerns for escalating housing prices. Those escalating prices are our equity, our investment in our homes that we've spent 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years in some cases 
paying for and maintaining. Why exactly do we want to undermine that? I'm not sure. I've been in the real estate industry for over 25 years. Anyone in the industry knows that home ownership is preferable to leasing for any community. Ownership builds community generational wealth. The only people who build wealth via rental units are the developers and the landlords. Home ownership also benefits communities, so much so that many condo associations limit the percentage of rental units allowable in a condo complex. They do that to maintain the value and the quality and the integrity of the condo complex. Homeowners create a sense of permanence, of putting down roots. In addition to voting no on this application, we need to place parameters on the number of new rental units approved in town at all. I also think zoning needs to proactively limit the number of stories allowed on buildings for all future projects. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Robert Sirio, and I lived at 14 Rockland Drive, West Simsbury, been a resident of the town since 1985, and I must say this is my favorite town of all the towns I work in as a business owner. Um, I have several concerns about the handling of the property. For example, well, there, like, for example, like on Hot Meadow Street, are there plans to have a visual buffer of these buildings from the street so it doesn't look like the big mess that we have on Hot Meadow Street with all those apartments that are built? It looked like they just, you know, landed by a tornado. It not some other place where it's completely congested. Um, for example, I'm fairly happy with the Powder Forest project. I think the guys uh, have done a great job with that. It's laid out nice. Um, you know, it, it, it just looks attractive. That's a tornado. Um, it just looks attractive. So when you're driving down Bushy Hill or you're going down um, Stratton Brook, you know, it just looks like it belongs. So my main concern is not to have another mess made. Now, we need to do something with the property. It's been sitting there for such a long time. Um, with regard to the amount of housing and occupants, I'm guessing it's really more like 12, 1,500 people if you're talking about close to 600 uh, dwellings, right? You know, not a couple of hundred. So we need to take into account what are we going to do with all these people? How many children are they going to have? What kind of resources are we going to have? Um, for example, are we going to have enough police? Are we going to have enough fire department? We're going to have enough ambulatory services. Um, and also, how about the town grid for electricity? Obviously, now we had the storm. It wasn't that bad, but we lost a lot of power and internet. So these things need to be looked at from an infrastructure, which is how I look at things, more of an engineering background uh, in there. So with that said, 
Has anybody taken into effect what the municipal costs are going to be as to tax revenue on these properties? How much is it going to cost us? So, for example, when I moved here in 1985, as to date, I have a slightly larger house, but my taxes have gone up fivefold from when I started here. Uh, so, we need to look at is this a viable business project where we provide housing and bring more people into our town? Or are we going to raise enough revenue? in uh, taxable income to cover additional police, fire, safety, uh, the expansion of the electrical grid. And I know there are some concerns with people who live up on, on, on Hot Meadow Street as far as traffic. Um, but that's something you guys are going to have to work on. Um, So at some point, will we be giving some type of analysis as to profit and loss relative to what it's going to take to build this facility for the people and grow the town in a responsible manner so that we don't end up having to raise our taxes another 10, 12 percent to cover the shortfall because there's not enough revenue coming in to cover all of these municipal expenses. So at some point, will we be receiving some type of um, thought out plan that helps our town in a positive manner? That's my main question. Is there plans for that? We're not intending this as a debate opportunity between the commission and the public. We're not intending this as a debate opportunity between the public and the commission. We'll consider the question that you raised and we'll, we'll Included in our conversation right. in the next several Right. Years. I just want to bring it up as a concern because, you know, it's enough. Most of the material, if not all the material that was presented by the applicant, is available on the town website. Anybody who wants to read this, the uh, work that they delivered on the impact on the school system, it's right there. You can see what they have right. to say. Just right. Read. Now, you ter you, your, as your board, are you taking that into consideration as what this building is going to be? For costing the town uh, before you approve it? Uh, this particular public building you're talking about? I, I went to junior high school and high school here. I, I'm from way back, but yeah. no, I wasn't on any voting, uh, in any voting position for the building in this structure. Right. And on this, on the one that's in front of us, 200 uh, Hot Metal Street, we haven't voted yet, so we'll see who's there when they take yeah. it. Uh, we, we expect to get more information to raise many of the issues like I said, my concern is just a matter of if this is going to get done, it gets done in a responsible manner that really not put any additional burden on us. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that the, the town administration over the last 200 years has done a perfect job, but I think that almost everybody who served in one of these jobs has done their best, whether in the end it, it turned out that way. Um, yeah. You know, I can't attest every one of those, but right. a lot of the work, as you point out, including uh, the Ensa and Bickford efforts over time, have done well. Some things have not been as pleasing to the eye or economically as we as hoped. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm just looking out for the town and looking out because it's my favorite place to live. I can live anywhere I want, but I really like living here. So thank you. Caution. Hopefully it gets uh, well thought out. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I could just, just interrupt for just one second. Are we good on recording? Are you good? Recording is back. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Charlie Get 72 East Weetog Street. Um, I, I guess, I, listening to some other people's comments, I, I don't need to be redundant on any, on any of that, but I would say that if in fact it's true that the commercial aspect of the first development isn't complete, you have a piece of leverage right now that if you were to even move anywhere forward, um, if that in fact hasn't been completed, I wouldn't deleverage myself in any way, shape, or form. I would say this application is parked until that's done, and then you can discuss it. That's, that's just a piece of leverage. Um, the, the other part is I did read through the impact on the school district, um, sort of reads a little like the Venezuelan 
um, financial plan. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing in that, according to this math, the people who pay less than the average people in Simsbury will contribute more towards <laughs> the educational aspect. It, it, it simply mathematically doesn't work. Um, and I, I read through it and I saw the gymnastics that they went through, and they're impressive, um, but it just simply doesn't hold water. And what I would say is the gentleman prior uh, mentioned, have we seen a full fiscal rollout? Because without that, I don't think, I, I don't think a, a ruling can be made. Um, I've done some real basic math here. And the town budget last year was $115 million spent in Simsbury. That's across everything. Um, and residents just don't use one piece of the budget. Everybody's entitled to every benefit of Simsbury. It doesn't matter if you pay the most taxes or the least taxes. If you live here, you're entitled to the education, the protection, the snow plows, all of those things. And everyone gets spent on in equal measure, whether you're an old person or a young person, and everybody in between. But the fact of the matter is there's 25,000 residents in this town at 115 million. That's about $4,600 spent per person in Simsbury on a resident. Great, you can like that number or not like that number, but that's a number, fact. Um, there are 9,500 households. That's $12,100 per household. That's a fact. It's not really sort of fudging it around. The numbers that they put forward to this particular project, 580 residences, um, it's gonna be at $4 million in overall contribution. Uh, you're way shy uh, of that overall contribution. You'll be about four million bucks in the hole in perpetuity with this project, in perpetuity. And I think the gentleman made a great point, is what you do in zoning is crucial. The, everyone else can screw up a little bit here or there, but when you do something, Shovels go in the ground. Concrete gets poured. That stuff's permanent. Um, so you're locking in a bad fiscal equation. And as much as I can be sensitive to people saying, hey, there should be more affordable housing, there should be this and that, those things are all true. But if people can't afford their taxes, then <laughs> it's all for naught. You're trying to solve something um, for virtue reasons when in fact the mathematics won't work. I would say please, please, please get a fiscal impact plan, a real one, and not cherry picking on the fiction uh, of this contribution towards students. It's all on assumptions and they're all wrong. What I gave you are stone cold numbers. Um, and lean into those and you'll make a better decision, I think. Thank you for your time. Uh, that's actually not mine. Hi, Susan Salina, 33 Alder Road. I am a recently former chair of the Board of Education here in town and would just like to, uh, after 16 years on the board, saw a lot of these developments come in. A lot of the student numbers that we were told to expect were far exceed what any developer gave us. And the Ridge North is a great example of that. We started off with those kids in Latimer Lane School and because of the volume and the overwhelming impact to Latimer, had to redistrict them to Central. They live right by Latimer Lane. We cannot take them there. We are doing, or they are doing, all this great work on Latimer Lane. And we are looking at a potential redistricting of the town to accommodate the influx of kids. So I caution you in any developer's numbers. There is a chart that has been widely shared by Neil Sullivan who talks with every developer, every developer and every property manager. Those numbers increase rapidly. And I just would like you to be aware of that as you go through your deliberations. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, a lot's been said about the traffic and how um, the traffic when the Hartford was here and what this is similar or less um, we didn't have Aspenwood uh, or Aspen Green. We did not have the Ridge North. We did not have Highcroft. We have so many more people in town now than we did when the Hartford was an active corporate park. So bear that in mind when people tell you the traffic's not a big impact. Um, I work at Town Hall. Making a left out of there at 4.30 in the afternoon can take me 10 to 15 minutes. 
the town is busy. And I think that we, um, there's good and bad in that. I just think we need to know what we're getting ourselves into. And this is a large number of people coming into Simsbury in short order. Thank you. Good, e uh, good evening. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Paul McKenna, 16 Pine Glen Road, Simsbury. Um, I, I kind of straddle the fence here a little bit. Um, I believe when somebody buys a property, they have a certain right to do what they want with their property. But I think, as many of the people have spoken out here, it's incumbent that you integrate into the community. Um, I, many of the speakers have already done what my voice won't allow, and that is spoken to the cost effectiveness of this. I think there's some serious ramifications. Um, when you talk about people moving into this town, it's been said over and over and over again. And uh, Bruce, you've been here. Uh, I lived at Talcott Acres when it was a field. There wasn't a Harvard over there So um, for all you people. And I remember how Joan Co. worked so hard to make sure there were huge trees and berms and buffers and that view was not ruined. So I think you have people here that have great legacy in this town, respecting it. I'm not denigrating the plan. I'm saying that I think there's some more information that needs to be brought to the table from other sources so that the board can do their elected duty. Uh, I think Charlie did an excellent job on the numbers. You, you really have to sit there. When I talk about schools, there's nobody, there's no family that moved to town and said they moved here for Simsbury Farms golf course. It's a great golf course, but they moved here for their kids to go to these schools. And I think you're laughing up your sleeve when you're telling somebody they're, you're not gonna fill this place up with people with kids. You gotta be kidding me. To the point of affordable living, you can rent in Simsbury when you can't buy. And we've already seen that in the increase in the number of students. You can rent and you can buy a Simsbury education. And it's a lot cheaper than buying a house in Simsbury and buying a Simsbury education. And I think this is a very serious matter that you people really need to review. Uh, I, I, my kids went through the Latimer Lane school system. It really existed, I'm not that old. Um, but it was, it was a great school. Um, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> not the president, but he was the principal. And it was a great school. But it's, it, you know, you've all spoken to people on the education committee. There, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And I, I don't want to throw an anchor over the side of progress, but I do think that there are serious financial shortfalls that we are going to all going to pay for. I did buy my house a long time ago in Simsbury. It's worth a lot more. I'm also paying almost five times as much taxes as everybody else is too for the goods and service that we value. But I, I really think that the numbers that were brought up today are ones that the zoning committee really, commission really needs to evaluate in a more serious fashion and look on the impact, not so much on the people moving in while they will be important members of our community and they, and they will be welcome members, but they need to be welcomed as long as they're not having such a negative impact on the quality of life or the fiscal demands of the people that are already here. Thank you very much for your time. Good evening, uh, Pat Weisbrick, 3 Lenora Drive, and uh, there's not too much that I can say that hasn't been said, but quality of life and the school system is what brought us here. And I'm sure there's people that have been here longer than us, but I don't think any of the speakers have, um, so, except for Joan. <laughs> anyway, um, there's a couple things that I think are getting lost in, in uh, the noise of this whole pro project. And if I felt that this project was unique and something that was uh, really tailored to the needs of Simsbury, I might have a different view of it. But, um, you know, this lovely picture, uh, it was in the paper, it was up on the board. 
That could be Bloomfield. That could be Granby. That could be Canton. It could be West Hartford. It could be any place. It's not unique. It's just another cookie cutter development. And uh, the fact that it's all rental it has already been, uh, it just makes my hair stand on end, quite frankly. But I think what's really missing here, number one, is jobs. And number two, how this is being driven by 830G. 830G has a poison pill in the language. And the poison pill is the 40-year requirement that it be in the deed. That means that, not, now, if you talk about affordable housing, we used, the narrative has been changed. We used to talk about something that people could afford, something that's reasonably priced. That's not what this is all about. If you look at the rental, what the rental costs are going to be for all these places, apart from the 58 that are being set aside, in marketing they call that loss leaders. Loss leader, okay, so 58 families get to move in and not pay market price. Everything else is market price, and you know who's going to win? The developer. Not the town of Simsbury. We've had a lot of development in the 80, uh, 40 years that we've been here, and my taxes have gone up and up and up. This last year, it went up 25%. I'm not a happy camper. But I want you to know about this 10% that the town, and you know, 830G says every town has to ha ha meet a 10%. You can't get there from here. You run the numbers, I can give them to you. If you keep adding units and adding units at 10% at and the other 90% are market value, we could add 100 million units here and only get to 9.9%. And I can tell you, I've done a little bit of work around town and there are so many units that are not being included in the 4.8% that the state says Simsbury has now. None of the condominiums are. None of the planned, uh, uh, the PUDs, uh, planned urban develop development and, and the rental, all that stuff was built earlier, doesn't have a, a 40 year um, uh, requirement in the deed. And I just did, I, I don't have access, real access to the numbers, but I came up with uh, over 1,400 units that aren't being counted. And yet, developers are coming in from out of state, and I can't say that um, our in-state developer of, um, um, what is it up in the north end? I'm sorry? Uh, one from Avon. Uh, yeah, but, uh, Bill Ferrigno. It's Bill Ferrigno is in my graduating class. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the, it, it's, it's just unbelievable that the, the pre predatory development coming in to try to take advantage of a statute 830G, and it really doesn't matter what town it is. It's the same cookie cutter type development that is going to ruin the character of the town and leave us with a lot of bills. Uh, so thank you for your time, I appreciate it. And I, I do want to say I appreciate every one of you who um, takes time out of their personal life to do it. It's uh, kind of a thankless job. Uh, but I do hope that you will take all these considerations, uh, or all these things that everybody has said in, uh, in heavy consideration, because once it's gone, it's gone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Commission. Um, Steve Bovey, One Simscroft Place. Uh, so I, you know, haven't haven't don't have the years of some of the individuals here, but uh, moved here eight eight years ago. Um, got a job opportunity and 
looked at several different towns and, and picked this one because I, I basically a small New England town that I felt fell in love with. Um, uh, you know, since over the eight years, I've seen um, quite quite a few changes. I mean, you can go up and down Hop Meadow Street, and I would you know see see all the different um, buildings and different residential um, establishments, but it, you, you know. It doesn't, it, you, you can drive down Hop Meadow Street during rush hour and you, you can see how unsafe it is. I, I mean, people are in the middle of the intersections. There, uh, sometimes there's three cars in the middle of the intersection. And, you know, it's getting to the point where, you know, I, you, you want, one, it's getting to be like a safety issue. Like, how do you get a fire truck through? How do you get an ambulance through? Um, you know, it's going to get worse in the winter time. So, you know, I have some. I, I'd like the the commission and uh, to look at you know surf, certainly the traffic issue because I mean it's it's pretty bad. Um, and then another thing is uh, the the crime. Um, and, and with crime, you, you you know, I don't know if our police is uh, you know overburdened or what have you, but you know, I had. Recently, a, a car dropped in front of my house, doors open, was stolen, uh, up two houses up, that was stolen. Um, you look at the police reports, um, and I, I do see that are public. You can go and you can see the addresses, and uh, you know, I, don't, I, I just wonder if the commission could look, um, see if there's any correlation with an increase in police calls and do do that kind of study to see if there's any kind of, um, because it is gonna take more police and, and stuff with more residents. Um, and then uh, final thing I haven't really heard was like environmental, right? Um, so like every, every, almost every day I have a bear flip over my garbage. Um, <laughs> and sometimes three bears. So, you know, it's getting to the point where, you know, yes, the Hartford was there, but like two wrongs don't make a right, you know? So like, I, I don't know if the Hartford should have went there. I wasn't here when the Hartford went up, um, uh, but I'm sure there's animals living in that area right now. Um, so, you know, they're not gonna be living there anymore. So they're gonna be in our backyards and eating our garbage and, um, so just look, look at the environmental impact. And then, you know, one more thing on, one more thing in, on the um, traffic is, you know, it seems that, you know, we identified a problem with the Hartford. So using that as a data point that, oh, it's as good as the Hartford. Well, I think we can do better than what the Hartford was because the point that you're, you're referring to, it, you, you know, the Hartford was bad from what I've heard from people. So, you know, that's like not even taking into account all the other housing projects that have gone up. So um, that's it. And thank you. Thank you for the time. Mary Turner, 11 Barnard Drive, Simsbury. I've lived in this town for, 54, uh, for, uh, for 45 years came to town because of its school system. The town is turning out like the town I left in Bristol and other, other towns. My concern is I don't think that anybody has really done a research on how much, because I'm a businesswoman, I look at not just the revenue, I look at the expenses. So they talk about how much revenue they're going to bring into the town. But the cost of police will have to be increased. There's no question. Same thing with the fire department. They're going to have to increase there. The school system, for sure, will have to be increased. And maybe another school built. Then you have the consideration of your traffic. 
which is insane right now, but I could see easily a four-lane highway, Route 10 turning into a four-lane highway. And no one is talking about the social services, which for sure is going to be needed because even though you have an increase in crime, behind increase in crime is also your social services with their basic issues. So you're talking about a negative and a strain on this town. And they've already increased the values of all of our homes so that our taxes will be going up quite a bit. So if you don't think that the town residents now are paying a lot, this, it's going to be skyrocketing. <clears throat> and it will force us out of our own town to accommodate for the transient new neighbors. That's what we are, transient new neighbors in this development, which I don't think they've given much con uh, consideration of the expenses versus the revenue. Every time I hear someone say, oh, they're gonna bring in this much in thousands of dollars, well, guess what? You're gonna be paying millions, much more. Thank you very much. Evening, my name is Al Oisbrich, uh, 3 Lenore Drive. Um, I thank you on the board for your service, being volunteers, it's uh, uh, a hard job. But I think you need to know, you're now at a position that's much more difficult than when boards of your type were 20, 30 years ago because the consequence of your decisions now are going to be much more critical. In the past, when you had somebody come along, a developer, and, and do something, there was plenty of room for error. The margin for error is getting very small, if not uh, impossible, really, to, to get back from once you go down that road. So, you are now saddled with some serious decisions and it's gonna reflect on you. It's gonna be on your back what happens to this town. The notion that uh, these outside developers can come in here, give you a nice song and dance, and they do, I'm sure, the best they can because obviously all the numbers that they come up with are intended to be in their favor. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. And I see very little on the part of boards like you that do their own analysis or have a really a third credible party other than people that come up here sometimes. And I've seen some very intelligent people that know how to run numbers. And as an engineer, I, I give them a lot of credit for doing that doing your job to some degree because you just don't buy that stuff hook, line, and sinker because it sounds good. Oh, the school is going to be just fine, you know, and oh, the revenue is going to make it all great for the town when you know the numbers have already been given that there are so many other issues that come into play that you don't break even even. You're going to go in the hole further and further as time goes on. So as Reagan says, trust, but verify. So I just leave you with that thought. Hi, I'm Jolene Benedict, and I live at 14 Riley Road at the Ridge North. I just wanted to throw a few of my own feelings out. I moved to Simsbury as a child with my family in 1968. 
And I've lived here all of that time, except for 20 years spent in Amherst, Massachusetts. When I moved back, I was a consultant, and I wasn't ready to buy a home. And there really wasn't any place to live in Simsbury. I found a place, but it, it wasn't ideal, and I wanted to be in Simsbury. Recently, I moved in with my parents, and they were sick. My mother died. My father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's shortly after that. <clears throat> and I took care of him for six years. He died suddenly with no notice <clears throat> from something else, and I was faced with the decision as to keeping that house or buying something else or moving to an apartment. And I'm very thankful that I didn't have to make a permanent choice while I was grieving. <clears throat> Nobody should have to do that. So I want to say how grateful I was that there was a place like the Ridge to move into that was safe, beautiful, and I have great neighbors. And I want to tell you about some of those neighbors who are not transient people coming to Simsbury. I have neighbors at the anthology that were mine and my parents' friends that are in their late 80s. They're really happy that they don't have to change the stores that they go to or move someplace where they're not able to drive to see their friends who are still in some spirit. Some of my other neighbors are in their 20s who moved into a townhouse for two years while they saved for their own permanent house. I have other neighbors who their children, all of them, grew up in Simsbury, and they had a home, paid taxes on their home for 40 or 50 years, and are comfortably retiring in the Ridge now, in the hometown that they've lived in for many years. So I know there are many challenges facing our town with um, the increase in the number of, quote, luxury apartments, but I, I, I want to say they're really not luxury. It's just the same standard of living that you would like to have in a home. And it's in Simsbury. And again, I'm really glad that we have choices of different places to live in Simsbury. Uh, Diana Moody, 7 Elsie Way. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I am going to make it brief. Um, I know that whenever I vote for any town official, <clears throat> I want them to be a visionary. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Many years ago, when my husband and I moved here, we lived in Granby. Uh, they wanted to build a trash transfer station where the stop and shop is. I'm not saying this is comparing this to a trash transfer station, but I'm talking about the visionary, thinking ahead in the future, what, you're, what people want to see when they drive into this town. So I think that's a piece of it, because it is at the beginning of town. Uh, secondly, uh, however many years back, whenever we decided that we wanted to uh, <clears throat> have a town manager, so the town employed a consultant, and the consultant had various focus groups, which was very interesting. I was on, in one of those focus groups. And the consultant was just, he was so impressed with this town. I can't remember where he was from, but he said, I have not seen a town like this anywhere. He said, and I can tell you that since I've been here, the people that I have talked to outside would give anything to live in a town like this. So what I say to you and what I ask of you is that when making this decision or any decision going forward, how do you see this town, this development in 10, 
or 20 years from now? How do you see that? How do you see that impact and the ramifications on your decisions? And thank you very much, because I, I, I do know that you put a lot of thought into it. So I do appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Hi, Jesse Schofield, uh, 9 Fairview Street. Um, I think the housing is economic development, and uh, I really wish this was more mixed use, but I assume the demand just isn't there uh, based on the previous development and seeing some of the empty spaces uh, down near Whole Foods and other spots that don't seem to have the demand there either. Um, the issue I want to raise is just the the kind of the log jam we have in town. Uh, my, my wife and I returned to Simsbury recently. Uh, it, it obviously was a big headache to try to find a house that was for sale. There's really low vacancy, really low inventory available. Uh, we knew we wanted to live here, like many people my age who are from Simsbury originally as well. Uh, it, it seemed like one of the issues was that pe people who had down wanted downsize, they didn't have an option within town to stay here. They like Simsbury, they wanna stay in it. Maybe they don't need you know, a, a four bedroom house uh, for just two people, but there weren't any options they could pick from. So you know, that's one of the reasons I like a, a development like this, uh, even with flaws that people have pointed out, to have some option where people can stay here, move there. I don't believe that it's necessarily gonna be some very cheap spot uh, price wise, so it's not exactly opening up a lot of other people to come in versus a local kind of adjustment. Um, some of the issues I wanted to raise, uh, looking at some of the past plans, I think I saw a preliminary layout with about 348 units. Uh, by June, that was 540, and then now we're at about 580. I, I don't know if that's just capitalizing on kind of an economy of scale for building or adding kind of an amount to move down from. Uh, I know there is a very significant amount of parking, uh, and I also wonder, since there was a lot of discussion for the vessel, uh, how do you move the water and the snow uh, from all these you know, impervious surfaces? And if that's a future discussion, uh, I saw a lot of that planning was uh, kind of a noted to be determined later. Um, I, I saw the notes about the school. I, I have two young uh, children, uh, almost both of them in the Simsbury schools now. Uh, I do have a lot of faith that we can handle uh, more students in school. I understand it, it requires adjustment, but you know, a decade ago, maybe two decades ago, when I, I graduated from Simsbury High, I, I feel like we had a lot more students in the whole school system then. Uh, maybe just correct planning on a slow adjustment uh, as preferred. Uh, the last note I have, though, is about the single family homes. Um, looking at what Silverman Group has done, uh, I, I don't doubt they can build a lot more of the apartments, seems like a lot of the stuff they build also is kind of logistic hubs, tilt ups. Um, so I just have some concerns about the single family homes, kind of building them, uh, how they plan that out. And, you know, I don't want to apply any of those assumptions to them, but seeing as there was another single family home development that, you know, ran into some issues, some of that had to do with maybe costs going up a bit quicker than it, they were planning for, uh, for building or pricing. Uh, I just want some consideration about how we can make sure those single family homes are built per the plan and accommodated, whether that's through bonding or some other kind of contingency uh, to make sure they're, they're built and it's not just one single family saying, hey, please you know, fix these items that doesn't get the same attention as maybe the apartment building. Oh, thank you. Good evening, Jerry Toner, 26 Ridge Road. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, tonight. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the job that the, I think the developer has put a lot of effort in, into this to meet some of the, uh, the concerns that have probably already been, uh, been voiced. Um, I have been uh, a resident of Simsbury for 40 years and like most of these folks, my, my family and I have enjoyed a, a wonderful quality of life here. Um, I, 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 just go to really a lot of the comments that these folks made, and I think it's really based on that quality that they've enjoyed, whether it be education, whether it be, uh, um, you know, just the value that this town brings and, and not being the towns that others mentioned. Um, some, I always say sometimes you need to go somewhere else to appreciate what Simsbury gives you. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, some of the point tonight. Um, 
the, uh, the, the cost that will come along with this that will uh, impact the town are a concern to me. Um, the numbers of, of, of students that this would generate did seem very conservative. Sue Salina's comments, I think, uh, bore that out in terms of her past experience uh, with the Board of Ed. I, I do know that every year the Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen have an enormous task uh, to try and maintain the quality of life here and to make it affordable. And it's, it is an enormous task. And my concern is, is that a development like this and others make that all the more challenging. Um, Mary Turner, uh, I think, made great points. Uh, it's not just the education. It's the police. It's social services. It's all these peripheral costs that developments like these have. Um, anyone who drives down Route 10 now, you've all seen. We have all, you know, experienced a change. Um, and, uh, you know, is this the one that's going to uh, you know, break the camel, you know, uh, break the camel's back or whatever. I, I don't know, but it does seem um, uh, very uh, intrusive, not intrusive, but just very impactful. And I always looked at that, uh, that site. I think there was talk about the value of, of uh, the vista there and the, and the scenery. And I think that the developer did pay attention to that, the way they, they laid it out. But, you know, once that's gone, uh, it's not coming back. Uh, and I, I was not here when the, uh, the Hartford was proposed, but I, I do know that a lot of work went into minimizing that impact that that building had. So I would ask that those things all be considered. Um, you know, again, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I thank all the other folks who made just what I thought were very, very insightful comments. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody? Okay. Does anybody else want to speak? Um, it's nine o'clock. We could take a few minutes for some uh, points that, that uh, if the Silverman group would like to respond to some of the things that were said or not. But I'm going to close the meeting after we have a little more time together. But when I close the meeting, it's my intention to recommend to our commission that we continue the public hearing on this proposal to the next meeting, which is January 3rd. It's a Wednesday night. It will be 7 o'clock at the Sims Bay Library. But we'll get to that in a moment. First, if you're interested, you have the floor if you want to try to respond to some of what we said. Or enlighten us. If you'd like, uh, TJ, we could maybe take a few questions from commission members before we go to the Silverman Group. Comment again that you're going to extend it because I don't know if it, it gets oh. on the record. Uh, just so that it, it's clear on the record, my point of a couple of minutes ago is that while this meeting will be closing tonight, it's my intention to recommend that the public hearing that we're engaged in be con continued until the meeting on January 3rd. It's our next meeting. It's at the Simsbury Library, and it will be at 7 o'clock. I need a vote from the commission on that, so we'll come back to that point. I just want everyone to know that this isn't it. It's not over. We don't have to stay till midnight and try to resolve all the questions, but we'll, get, we'll, we'll have another opportunity. And for people who, I don't know, maybe they didn't uh, get here because of the weather um, or didn't feel you know, they had the time today, maybe we'll see them on January 3rd. Um, I think it's important that everyone who wants to say something get an opportunity to say it. And so, let's do this. We'll start with the commission members. Do you, do you have any questions you want to ask right now? Shannon? Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions and a comment. And um, 
Okay, so first of all, being newer to the um, commission, this might have been discussed, but I'm interested in what the cost of a rental unit is. Um, at each level. Additionally, is there affordable housing in this development? Uh, second, is there housing which com complies with ADA requirements other than the single family units? And is there any opportunity for supportive living? Um, I did want to also just comment that I definitely share concerns for the schools, the roads, fire, emergency services, and social services. If, if commissioners could try to use their mics, I, I, your own mic, I think it may work. Uh, so I'm going to try to answer your questions regarding the rentals. And obviously everything is speculative right now and will be, again, market-based for the 90% of units that are market rate. Uh, right now we're underwriting that for the apartments, a, a one-bedroom would go for roughly $1,600 a month. Uh, two bedroom, uh, a little over 2,100. Uh, the duplex units, which are the two bedrooms there, uh, around $3,500 a month. And the single family, uh, roughly on average, a little over $5,000 a month. And the plan as submitted calls for a, a 10% 30G matching uh, compliance with the units, even though it's not a 30G application. Thank you. I don't want to be labor, but I thought that the proposal said there was a 10% commitment. Yeah, there is. Yeah. And yeah. the 30% was? No. 30G. Oh, okay. Did you hear the other questions? Um, is there housing which complies with ADA other than the single family units? Yes, the apartments all have elevators, so they are 10% will be designated um, adaptable units, which is when an access somebody who needs that level of accessibility moves in. The resident in an apartment can be adapted to serve that. The remainder of the units will be um, also a level of accessibility, but just a slightly lesser level. Um, everything is visitable and uh, first floor and all the single families duplexes are uh, accessible on the first floor. So if for wheelchair use? Yes. A certain percentage could be created to accommodate that in Correct. the apartment? Yes, because all of the apartments are accessible via the elevator. They all have that level of visibility and accessibility. So for example, if the resident needs grab bars to be installed, those would be installed at the time that the resident were to move in. Wider doorways? Uh, 36 is the uh, handicap accessible code requirement, 36 inches, and that would be provided throughout. Um, and then my, my final question was, um, is there housing which supports supportive living? Leave that to more of a use type supportive. Um, I mean, someone with um, a disability who may need support services within their, you know, is there is there that option? We'll 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 prepare an answer for that. I'm sorry. What? We'll prepare an answer for that before we meet again. Okay. Thank you.
Zoning Commission members want to ask any other questions right now? I have well, one question. Uh, why 580? Why not 180 or 280? Is it an economic reason for that? Uh, I, the developer should answer that, but he might want to develop some information for you. We went through a lot of iterations with VHB about how to lay out the site. You know, 580 is not necessarily a magic number. Um, again, we tried to tried to provide a mix of apartment units and, and duplexes and single families, and this is where we laid out. Uh, for reference, it's almost identically the same density in terms of units per acre as, as the north site, uh, over the 124 acres. And the other metrics, uh, sewer capacity, sewer capacity, traffic, everything else. I mean, we did the full design and valuation of the site, and the site can't support that number. Um, I'm wondering about the nature of the club. Is that, so I assume it's residents only, but I saw, I saw a bar area, I saw a lot of stuff going on there. Is that gonna be run, per, how is that, how is that, how is actually, is that being run? Are you guys going to need like a liquor permit and all that other stuff? Don't know. Can the committee use the mic so we can hear the question and yeah. the statements, please? I asked about the nature of the club. If they need a liquor permit or if it's going to be run through a third party or something. Uh, this is all just a private clubhouse. Um, yeah, uh, we're not providing any alcohol or anything. It's, uh, it's just... So it has like a bar area, it has like a pool, it has like the gym. It's just all just for the rest, like it's a rental space? Like they could rent it out as like for parties or whatever? It's just amenities for the residents. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. That was it. <laughs> Any other questions from the Zone Commission? Do you want to go ahead on some other topics that came up during the last two hours? Or we're, we're appreciative of your attention and, and, the, and we're appreciative of the comments and you can't go to one of these things without learning a few things, but the uh, staff report indicated that they were, it was highly likely we'd be back for the first meeting in January. And I think we could prepare ourselves for that and respond to some of those questions at that time, Mr. Chairman. That's fine, and we'll see you again on January 3rd. But in the meantime, I, I need a motion from our, well, let me just ask if there's anything else anyone wants to take up before we close this meeting. I will make a motion to continue this hearing. Would you like me to do that? Yes. Okay, I'll make a motion to continue the uh, public hearing until the next zoning meeting on January 3rd, on January 3rd at 7 p.m. <laughs> At the library. I will second that. Yes. At the library. At the library. At the library. Okay. Shannon, Shannon seconded. Uh, <laughs> any further discussion? Who's oh, oh, my turn? All in favor say aye, please. Aye. 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 The motion aye. carries, so we're all set now. Yeah. We're adjourning this meeting. We'll see everybody again.